Right then guys, it's PSL here, and I'm here for the first episode in my series on Grand Prix World. Now, for me, this is really the final series in the trilogy of series I plan to do on F1 Management Games. I've already done a series on Grand Prix Manager 2, and I've already done a series on EA F1 Manager. Personally, I think this is the best game of the lot. I really do, I think it is the best F1 management game there is. I prefer EA F1 Manager, but EA F1 Manager that is... Well, as a piece of entertainment media, it's fantastic, it's hilarious. But as a genuine management simulation game, it's not all that great. This game, on the other hand, is a very good management simulation game, and you know it's going to be, because it's made by the same company that made Grand Prix Manager and Grand Prix Manager 2. It really, this game, it just builds upon the very solid foundations of Grand Prix Manager 2. And with that being said, let's head on into the game. So, new game, and here we go with the team selection screen. Now, I haven't even mentioned, actually, this game is based off of the 1998 Formula 1 season. So, Williams are at the top purely because they were the team to beat in 1997, having won the Constructors' Championship, and of course Jacques Villeneuve, driving for the team, won the Drivers' Championship, and he tried in vain to defend that championship in 1998. The thing is though, is even despite that, Jacques Villeneuve shouldn't be in the game. He really shouldn't, because in the original release of the game, Williams looked like this. Now, as you could tell, that's a bit different. Jacques Villeneuve, with a photo, that isn't Jacques Villeneuve in the photo, and they don't call him Jacques Villeneuve in the photo. They call him John Newhouse, which is effectively just an anglicised version of his French-Canadian name. A very clever workaround, and a workaround to Villeneuve's own restrictions. Well, he owned the rights to his own name and image. So, I believe, I think without paying a lot of money just to get Villeneuve's name and image, they couldn't put him in the game because of licensing restrictions. So, to get around it, as I said, they just had a knockoff version. And as I said, quite a clever workaround, actually, just anglicising Villeneuve. And it's less of a on-the-nose workaround than on F1 1997, where they called him Williams Number 1. Let's get rid of that. So let's go back to Williams as I'm seeing them. Anyway, Villeneuve's in the game and... Just for the sake of authenticity and realism, I'm glad to have him here, even though he wasn't in the original game. And also it's consistent anyway, because in Grand Prix Manager 2, he was in the game. He was in my series on Grand Prix Manager 2, even though he wasn't in the original release of the game. But again, on Grand Prix Manager 2, I had a, a mod, a settings mod, for that which put Villeneuve in. That wasn't the only reason I applied that mod, but that was one of the positive side effects to it. Anyway, long and short of it, Villeneuve is here, even though he wasn't in the original game and of course you've got Ferrari 95 million dollars Michael Schumacher what a team that is I do plan to go through all the teams and their situation and position because all the teams are genuinely in a unique position on this game they do have their own unique challenges for example Prost 55 million dollars that's a lot of money for a team which in 1998 only finished ninth in the constructors championship so they're not all that quick out on track but 55 million dollars that's loads of money to move them up the field so you know there's a challenge there Prost they got no on track performance but lots of money to get them towards the front Sauber they've got a team sponsor that's worth its weight in gold Arrows, they've got quite a bit of money, and they've got Pedro Diniz, who is a very handy driver to have. Stewart, they got Barrichello, but only $30 million funding, but they have got a works for deal. There is the bottom two teams, however, they've got no unique strengths, and all the weaknesses. Now, that does bring me on to this game, and one element of Grand Prix World I do like, because... Grand Prix World is the only F1 management game I've played where you get a sense of size and scale of all the teams. Minardi and Tyrrell are small teams, and they do feel small, because, well just for example, I mean, in testing, I mean you have to, 
you, obviously, you know, they've got lowly skilled staff and they haven't got a lot of money. That's obvious. Both teams have got at least one pay driver. Both teams have only got $25 million. And both teams have got, you know, not very well skilled, cheap designers, etc. The thing is, though, in this game, unlike on FL Manager and unlike, to a certain extent, on Grand Prix Manager 2, it's not just a case of getting the best person in the field. For example, the Adrian Newey's of the world. It's not just a case of getting the best person, sitting back, letting them do all the work. In this game, Adrian Newey, by himself, can do nothing. He's useless. Adrian Newey, with a team of 20 people, you can get good stuff then done, I suppose, but not very quickly. Adrian Newey, with a team of 80 people, that's a recipe for success. And Tyrell and Minardi, they haven't got that many people, but they also don't have the money to afford more people in the first place. Genuinely, Minardi and Tyrell, they got so few people that it's actually a bit of a struggle just to keep both of their cars in a raceable condition because they don't have that many mechanics. So you have to dedicate such a large portion of their small mechanic department just to keep the cars running. Whereas Ferrari, they've got a lot of people so they can have you know a small amount of their massive mechanic department to repair the cars and then another department or another section of their massive mechanic department to do testing. Minardi they don't have skilled people they don't have the money to employ more people and actually going back to that testing example they don't even really have the money to do testing in the first place so I guess in that way it doesn't matter that they don't have the people to accommodate testing they can't afford to do testing in the first place and they can't afford to employ more people to be able to do testing anyway. They are really in a pickle, both Minardi and Tyrrell. Tyrrell are just one step up. They really are. They're again a small team, one pay driver, not a lot going on for Tyrrell, they're just one step up. But they have got the same budget, $25 million. And Tyrrell, they were on their knees by this point. This was Tyrrell's final year in Formula 1. That's the issue. It's not just money and skill, it's size as well. So, the team I'm going to manage is Stuart. Only a $30 million budget though. Look at that $30 million budget. There's only $5 million more than Tyrrell and Minardi. However, as I said, with lots of the teams, they've all got their own unique position. There are things going for Stuart. For example, Barrichello. Very highly skilled driver and probably the best value for money driver in the game. Well, let me just read what it says about Stuart. After an optimistic start, Stuart has had two dismal years. In 1998, the team was trolled by poor reliability and a weak performance by Jan Magnussen that saw him being replaced mid-season. And he was actually replaced by Jos Verstappen. The game does actually rag on Jan Magnussen. He's not that bad. He really isn't. I've seen him score a point in the first season in this game. He's not that bad. You know, if he can finish in the top six with this standard Stuart team, he's not dreadful. The game does rag on him. Anyway, let's start. So here we go. I'm going to manage Stuart. So here we are in the game in Milton Keynes. This is the same Milton Keynes base that would go on to be the home for Jaguar and then for Red Bull. First of all, okay, no news. Okay, right. First things first, let's have a look at our drivers. Barrichello, 4.1 million salary. That's not that bad for a driver whose skill ratings are this good. You know, that's... Barrichello is a godsend in this team. He really is. Jan Magnussen is better in this game than they're given credit for. He really honestly is. So... There you go. Um, one glaring issue, though, is that we don't have a test driver. And as you can see on this screen, we've got three cars. Look, 1998 cars build three. That's not to say that the third car is useless, because it isn't. The third car is still useful, because it can alleviate pressure from mechanics, you know, if, if they're bogged down with work for testing or whatever, and then we can just give one of our drivers a brand new, fresh, clean, unused car. To, so then the mechanics have to do less repairs race to race. But I would rather use the third car for testing, just because it means that testing is more efficient, cost effective effectively, so we may as well get a test driver. Now, as I said, Grand Prix World I think is a fantastic game, however, and the best F1 management game, or the best licensed F1 manager game, however, 
The attitude I have with test drivers, unfortunately, is much the same as it is in F1 Manager. Basically, you need one, but there's no point getting someone who's good. You may as well just get someone who's cheap. So I'm going to get John Fellows. 23 years old, British. Importantly, though, he's cheap. His ability ratings, they're rubbish. I don't actually care. The reason I'm getting John Fellows is because he's got two star. Two star, two out of five. I'm just... I will probably say 2 star, but it's 2 out of 5. All the ratings are out of 5, or most of them are in this game. So he's 2 out of 5 speed, and John Fellows, of all the non-F1 drivers, I think he's the only one, or certainly one of the few test drivers, to have a 2 out of 5 speed. And if there's any driver stat I'm going to prioritise, it's going to be speed. So we'll get John Fellows for 2 seasons. There you go. And we want him to start now. We could make him start in 99, but I want him in the team now. Now that he's in, we can get working on testing. So, testing. One thing I do want to show off is that the 1998 chassis, as it stands, we don't know how good it is. Well, I do know how good it is, but it isn't confirmed. Um, so, if we do... Testing, right. I can get lost in these screens, honestly. Um, we want... Okay, that's not that bad. I was looking at the testing cost per mile. One and a half thousand dollars per mile. That's not that bad. In fact, that's not quite in the middle. That's on the lower half of the spectrum because the cost per mile of testing ranges. It's just random from race to race. Sometimes it can be as low as $500, it can also be as high as $3,000 per mile. And if you're a bottom team, money really does matter. I mean, well, look, look in the top right corner. We have a budget of 30 million. That's nice and all, but the budget is kind of, well, it's not irrelevant, but the amount of money I actually have to play with is 1.6 million. And I say to play with, that's really just to keep the team afloat for the next 16 races. Luckily though, I mean, when you're a bottom team, you really... Like, you care how much testing costs. It's, it's something which is so minor, but if you're a bottom team, you really do care. If testing is $3,000 a mile, I wouldn't go. Unless it's at the start of the season, in which case, I would think about it. I generally go testing at the start of the season because it's the only time you can go testing where it's not cluttered really where the mechanics have got less work on so that's why I'm glad the testing at this point in the season is cheap so because we probably won't be testing all the time this season we just can't afford to do it on a regular basis let's spend pretty much 200 grand testing let's make it a round cost figure so, 173 miles worth of testing, and this is why we got our test driver, because it means we got three drivers to do testing. So it just means that we can get more done in testing, because we can say to John Fellows, right, I want you to focus on development. So, again, there's no real exact science to this either, to be honest. The development is the one that I really want to get done. We need to do development testing, however at the same time the development bar is the easiest one to fill up, so yeah, engine testing, this is probably going to be one of the few times we do engine testing. Right, that's fine. Perform testing, okay, so in the summary, yeah that's good, that's pretty much exactly what I was hoping for. The development bar has been maxed out, so if we click on the tick Handling information has been added, so if we go to the summary screen, we now know how good our chassis is. 40%, which, no matter how you interpret the number, I mean, 40% is 40%. You can interpret it to mean different things, but no matter which way you interpret it, 40% is not good. Yeah, we'll have to do more development testing so we can improve our chassis rating, because 40%... A 40% chassis is not competitive, really not competitive. It's probably the same as Minardi's and Tyrrell's, or probably close to. 
Right, so we've done that. Okay, what other testing do we do? Setup testing. Setup testing is very simple. You get setup points. You can then use them in the race. They're effectively, you just assign them to certain stats on both of your cars, and it's just a performance boost. The more setup points you have, the more you can give to your drivers, and the bigger of a performance boost you'll give to your drivers in qualifying and the race. So we've got a few points to dish out to Barrichello and Magnussen. Engine testing, right, this brings me on to a whole big topic. The types of deals we have. Now, Stuart. Stuart, 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 as I said, there's things going for Stuart and there's things not going for Stuart. The lack of money is not a good thing at Stuart. However, as I said, Barrichello is one of the beacons of hope at the team. However, the real shining light in Stuart is Ford. I'm not really pleased with Ford engines, but... It's the type of deal we have. We've got a works deal with Ford. A works deal means, first and foremost, if I can find it, it means, there you go, look at that, Ford are paying us $9.8 million. This is why you need a works deal. They pay you money. There's three types of deal you can get. There's a customer deal, which we have with Bridgestone, which means they give us tires, but we have to pay for them. There's a partner deal, which we do have with Texaco. I know it doesn't look like it, but we do have a partner deal with our fuel supplier. Partner deal, I believe, ordinarily means you get whatever it is for free. However, we've negotiated a bonus, so they pay us $260,000 as a bonus. Because you negotiate deals with suppliers and with sponsors, but even after you've signed a deal, you can continue to speak to these companies and schmooze them and get bonuses. So we've got a bonus sponsorship income from Texaco. We've also got two bonuses from Ford. One of them is fast engine upgrades and another is controlling engine R&D. Now this is why you want a works deal. Because firstly, well, a works deal is important no matter what size of team you are because if you're a big team you want to control the engine R&D and that isn't that's a bonus I believe that's not a given in a works deal you do have to negotiate uh, to be able to control engine R&D but that's why you want a works deal so then you can get the bonus to control engine R&D and if you're a top team where you've got loads of money you can do testing at every race and you've got loads of people Basically, if you've got the money and the people to do testing regularly, and a lot of testing, you can improve your engine massively. You really can. And the same goes for tyres, and the same goes for fuel. You can improve all of those parts if you've got the money and resources to do so. We've got a works deal. That means that Ford are paying us $9.8 million. The really worrying thing about that is that means that a third of the team's budget comes from Ford and that's why it works deal was important as I said for a big team it's all about the engine R&D so then you can improve you can improve the engine fuels tires if you get the controlling R&D so if you're a top team you can get that extra performance advantage if you have as I said the money and resources to be able to dedicate to that if you're a bottom team you can't really pump the money into test on a regular basis to improve the engine fuel and tires we probably won't be improving the engine that much ourselves, to be honest. However, we do need the money. So a works deal for a bottom team is vital just to keep the team afloat. $9.8 million. As I said, that's a third of the team's budget. If that was a partner deal, that's $9.8 million we wouldn't get. If that was a customer deal, we'd have to pay at least $6 million. $6 million. So... The difference between having a works deal and a customer deal is about $15 million. The Ford engines are alright, they're mediocre, to be honest. I don't really care for Ford engines, I'm just glad that there's someone giving us money, and a lot of money. However, we can do R&D control, we can control the R&D, there is a distinction there. So, because we did engine testing, um, we can... Okay, we got two remapping points, so you can remap the engine, which means we could take, for example, we could take a point off of fuel and put it onto power. Because that's the thing, is the Ford engine is actually really good, apart from the fact it's 
very poor in terms of reliability, and it's not got a lot of power. And that's really weird to say, because you would think, on the face of it, the only thing that matters in an engine is power and reliability. But in this game, there's a lot more to it. And actually, in all other regards, the engine's good. It's light. It's got high rigidity, which... Rigidity is, to a point, the most important aspect for an engine in this game. But yeah, you can remap the engine, so we could take a couple of points off of fuel and put it onto power. But that's not really an improvement, that's just a sideways movement. But because we control the R&D, we can actually improve the engine. So we got one improvement point by doing testing, and I'm going to... I'm going to put it on power. Why not? It's either power or reliability, but I'm going to prioritise power. So, there you go, we have improved the engine. That's one of the perks to having a works deal. We can do tyre testing, but it would be a waste of manpower, to be honest, because we can't improve the tyres at all. And fuel. Fuel, fuel, fuel. Now, we got a partner deal, and we can also assist on R&D. I think we unlocked the bonus for that. Assisting R&D just means because... Well, with the engines, you can control the R&D, which means you can remap the engine or improve it. With the fuel, because we can only assist in R&D, what it means is that we can't improve the fuel. We can remap it, so we could do fuel testing, remap the fuel and make it more reliable, but then we're losing performance. Whereas if we control the R&D, we could improve the fuel, so then we wouldn't have to take any points off of the performance, and we could just put it onto engine tolerance. The 99 chassis, we could start work on that now. However, as you can see, we don't know the regulations for next season. The FI will announce that at some point. It, I think it is random to an extent, it does vary. And if you're a bottom team, this is where the lack of manpower at Tyrrell and Minardi really hurts, because, because they don't have that many designers, they can't design a chassis quickly. And because they have a very low-rated chief designer, the chassis they design will be rubbish anyway. So, we could start work on the chassis now, however, we don't know the regulations, and when the FIA do announce the regulations, it might well come to light that the chassis we were designing just so happens to be legal for next year. There's also a good chance that it won't be legal next year, and then all the work we've done has been, well, a complete waste of time, and we have to start again. So actually, if you're Tyrrell or Minardi, because it takes so long to, to design anything, what you're best off doing is starting the work on the chassis now, and then hoping that the chassis you were designing will be legal for next year, so then you've got a head start. Whereas if you're a top team, in fact even in Stuart, in Stuart I'm not going to design the chassis, because we've got enough people to wait for when the regulations come out, albeit only just, but we will have to dedicate a large portion of our designers to getting the chassis done. I just, I don't want to do it now because it's a gamble and it could be completely wasted resources. I would rather, I'd rather work on this season's chassis, but we don't know the solution, so we don't even know the problem actually. So I'm going to work on, in fact, do we want to do that? Yeah, yeah. Normally, I mean, if there was one that was one star performance or reliability, I would work on that, but actually there's quite a lot of our parts on two star rated, so we'll just, we will improve Ooh, I'm, I'm, I don't know whether to improve the performance or reliability of something. I tell you what, we'll, we will improve the performance of our clutch and then we'll start working on the lack of reliability on some of our other parts. Only 30% of our designers on this because it doesn't take that long. Or it's quite simple to design an improvement to a part. Designing a whole new driver aid, that takes a lot more people, so... We're going to split it up 70-30. 70% of our staff are going to work on designing a new driver aid. The only reason I'm working on... Because normally I wouldn't work on a driver aid. Not with a team this small and not this early in the career mode. But we can't improve our current chassis. I don't want to risk designing a new chassis because there's no chance it will be legal. Although having said that, there's, no, there's actually no guarantee that this active suspension driver aid will be legal. But I'm just going to work on it just for the time being, just for something to do, to be honest, um, until the next race in which all of our designs will be working on this year's chassis, improving this year's chassis. So yeah, 30% on the simple improvement to the clutch, and then 70% on the much more complicated design of a active suspension unit. 
Now, I've already talked about this briefly, of course, the assistants. I've already said about how important the size of the team is. So, for example, in fact, there's not even anyone to employ. Well, no extra assistants. Okay, let's go with the commercial department. Because there's no one available to hire in any department, you can pay $20,000 for a headhunter in the hopes he'll find someone. And he hasn't found anyone, so that's been a complete and utter waste of money. What about... What about... Oh, we can't have any people in all aspects, actually. You think so? You can end up wasting money. Good! Right, he's found... Okay, he's found a good person and a average assistant. In fact, two average assistants, I think. I don't really want to get trainee people because... I mean, look, we only have a capacity for 50 staff. You can expand that, and we almost certainly will have to. But we need more people just to get more work done. I've already said about how important the size of a team is just for being able to get more work done and increasing productivity. But, you know, in the same vein, very good people and excellent people get more work done than trainee people. So, basically, I'm just going to employ more people until we reach the capacity, in which case I'm going to start getting rid of trainee people and replacing them with better ones. So, yeah, I don't really want to get a trainee person because I know I'm just going to make them redundant in the near future anyway. Right, I'm going to sign people and then I'm going to end off this episode. So, we'll head to the chief designer because they're important. So, we've got a two star, two out of five rated chief designer. That's why our chassis is only 40% rated. So we definitely need to improve that because the biggest, the thing that's most letting us down on on-track performance is our chassis. Because the engine isn't that bad, our drivers are pretty good, Barrichello certainly is. It's the chassis that's really letting us down, so we want to get at least a 3-star rated chief designer. Let's have a quick look, Rory Byrne, $1.6 million. No thank you. Hang on, that's weird, Neil Oatley. Neil Oatley is 20% worse than Rory Byrne, but his salary is pretty much the same. If you're spending that sort of money on someone, you may as well just get Rory Byrne, because he's much better. Yeah, I mean, that does kind of bring up about this game, because, for example, there's lots of people who are 3-star rated. Look, Nick Worth, his salary, 1.1 million. Gavin Fisher from Williams, because these are the big, well-funded teams. Gavin Fisher, their chief designer, is one million a year salary, and we'd have to expand on that. But the problem is, is, well, look, Mike Gascoigne for Tyrrell, three-star rated, so the same rating, his salary, $240,000. That's because he's at a much smaller, less well-funded team. They can't afford to pay him as much. And that's one of the elements of this game that isn't really all that great, because there's no reason to get Gavin Fish or Nick Worth. Because there's only five different ratings that someone can be, and actually, really it's only four ratings, because there is no one who is in F1 who is below two-star rated. So actually, it's only really four different ratings that someone can be. There are one-star rated people, but I don't know why you'd get them. Yeah, because there's only really four ratings someone can actually be, it means that you get cheap people who are as good as people who cost four times as much. So we may as well get Mike Gascoigne, who is a quarter of the price of Gavin Fisher, is just as good and is better and cheaper than our current chief designer. Well, I say cheaper, the problem is, is we will have to expand upon Mike Gascoigne's salary. I think that will do it. You can only make... Um, actually, no, we'll go down to $300,000. You can only make one offer to someone between race weekends. So, if Mike Gascoigne doesn't accept this offer, then we have to wait until after the Australian Grand Prix before we can make him one more offer. If he rejects that, then we have to wait until after the next race. And really, once, you, once you've done about three, four, certainly five races in the season people start getting signed, and it's on a first-come, first-served basis, so if you don't get someone reasonably early on, someone else will, and then you have to get someone who's either less skilled or needlessly expensive. So, yeah, we want to get Gascoigne fairly quickly, so let's make an offer for him. 
and he's accepted. Right, good. So that's pressure off on the cheat designer front. So we're going to get a much better chassis in 2000 because, of course, we had to wait for Mike Gascoigne to arrive and then a year for him to design the chassis. But we've got chassis improvements on the way and we're paying less for it. We're literally getting more for less. Fantastic. I'm going to... Yeah, I'm going to sign other people. I'm going to cut it out and then... Well, I'll show you the signings I've made or tried to make um, in just a second. So, yeah, I'll see you then. So then, I've just finished discussions with the prospective heads of our various different departments. The commercial manager... I've agreed to keep our current commercial manager for another two seasons after this season. But anyway, Rob Armstrong, he's cheap. Firstly, in terms of salary, I mean, his current salary is $304,000. Now it's going to be $404,000, where it will be from next season onwards. Also, his sponsorship royalty, that's the big thing. His current sponsorship royalty is 2%. We had to improve on that, so he'll get 4% sponsorship royalty from next season. And for any other, you can't see actually, but for any other three star rated commercial manager, their current sponsorship royalty is 4 or 5%, and we'd have to improve on that. So you're talking 6 or 7% we'd have to offer them. 6 or 7%, and sponsorship royalty, that's just a performance bonus. So basically, Rob Armstrong, we're paying him 2% of the worth of sponsorship deals he brings in. As you can imagine, that gets expensive, and it's going to be up to 4%, which isn't exactly great. And, you know, if we got anyone else, or any other three-star rated person, we'd have to offer them more. So 6%. Imagine if it was 6%. Long and short of it, I've agreed to keep Rob Armstrong because his salary's low, and his sponsorship royalty is low, so he's cheaper on both counts. So that's the commercial manager. The chief engineer, I wasn't able to get anyone. I tried to get Harvey Postle Freight from Tyrrell for exactly the same reason that I got Mike Gascoigne. And that is because Harvey Postle Freight, well he's from Tyrrell so he's cheap. And he's also 3 star rated which is 1 star higher than our current technical director. The thing is though, is Harvey Postle Freight doesn't think that Stuart is financially stable. Which is hilarious, considering he's from the Castrap Tyrrell team. Anyway, Harvey Postlethwaite, all we have to do... I think, actually, I think we offered him a contract that was too long as well, but that's, that's fine, to be honest. All we have to do is approach him after the Australian Grand Prix, and then he'll suddenly decide that the team is financially stable enough, and that he wants to join us. And it's exactly the same situation with the Chief Mechanics. I tried to get the chief mechanic from Jordan and the chief mechanic from Sauber. Both of them rejected us. Basically what they mean is that Stuart is a worse team than Sauber and Jordan. And that's fair enough actually and completely correct and in fact Ernst Keller from Sauber, that was his only issue with the deal. Here's the thing, is after the Australian Grand Prix if we go up to Ernst Keller again and offer him the exact same contract he'll then decide that he's happy to go to Stewart, even though nothing's changed at the team. So, I mean, it does sort of make sense in a way, because at the end of the day, every person here wants a job. They want employment. And Ernst Keller, we're clearly desperate to get him, and we're offering him employment, and with a higher salary than he's getting at Sauber. So... Basically, it's a system in this game, and you could argue it's realism, but I do quite like it, actually, because it punishes you for having bad pass form. It punishes you because people, on the face of it, they don't want to go with you. You know, they no one's going to want to go from a top team to a bottom team, or no one's going to want to go down the order. But if you're a backmarker team, that doesn't mean it's impossible to get someone better. You just have to speak to that same person for longer. It takes longer to convince them to go down the field, to go to a worse team. So, it's a good system because, you know, it, it's, it does punish you for having bad pass form, but it doesn't make it impossible for you to get better people. And that is pretty much everything for this episode, so 
I hope you guys did enjoy this first episode in this series. I know it wasn't exactly the most action-packed episode in the world. There was no on-track action for starters, but as I'm sure you can appreciate, this is a management game and quite a deep one at that. And obviously, as a back marker team, there's lots of changes I want to make and need to make. So, you know, obviously there was a lot of setup work that had to be done. So, you know, that took a long time. But in the next episode, we will finally do the first round in the season, the Australian Grand Prix. So I'll see you guys in the second episode in this series on Grand Prix World.